to all of you beautiful, unconventional conventionists. Welcome back to Rocky Talkie. This is episode 16. It's been like 16 weeks. As always, I'm Nikki, and I'm joined by... John Aaron. Apparently, I hit the slow motion filter this week. <laughs> hey, guys, you want to talk at normal speed? What's up? How are you? I don't think I will for this show. I'm doing pretty freaking good. <laughs> uh, the week was really slow for me. I haven't really done much but play Animal Crossing all week because I'm in the process of completely redoing my island for the second time. So that's kind of been my entire week was like going to work and then at night playing some Animal Crossing and uh, hopefully finding all the villagers that I want for this new island. Wait, redoing it for the second time. Does that mean this is the third time total? Yeah. That you've been... Oh, yep. wow. Yep. So uh, the first island and then I broke it down, did another island and then I broke it down again and now I'm doing a new island. So Whew. this is like, I think I just passed the 1600 hour mark in Animal Crossing. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, I know, right? I have clearly the biggest dick on the planet. That's the one way to time. put it. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all aren't even ready, all right? This is going to be a fucking Animal Crossing island that is rooted in classism. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be something. I'm going to I'm writing lore for it. It's it's 10 out of 10. Wow, you have gone way too far. Good job. John, Correct. we live in a society. <laughs> we do live in a society, and I'm tired and it's of pretending on you. that we don't. <laughs> what about you, Aaron? What'd you do? Well, my my week was pretty good as well. Um, I've been playing around with doing a bunch of video editing. I've been relearning all of the janky crap that happens when you try and move assets between After Effects and Premiere and the whole Adobe suite. It's been pretty fun. I haven't done a lot of it since college, so reflexing some of those muscles, learning some new stuff. It's always fun, but tedious. Tedious and slow. I dare say that that is pretty sweet of you. What? Because <laughs> Adobe Sweet. Ha. Ah, ha, ha. Ah. He yeah. made a funny. He yeah. made a haha. -ha. I'm laughing. So good. Woohoo. I'm laughing. I'm John. Hi, John. I'm Dad. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it seems like it's been pretty good weeks for both of you. I'm very I'm very happy for you guys, you know? It's just it's how it is. <laughs> What'd you do, Nikki? This week was pretty good. I'm preparing to go back to work soon, which I'm very excited about. I've kind of been freeloading, chilling on unemployment, and my job is reopening soon, and I'm very excited to get back out there and feel like a person again. Ooh, productive. Could it be me? <laughs> <laughs> But you know, it's yeah, it's exciting. And with that, let's get started with our first segment, Global News. We're starting off Global News with an exciting announcement about the Rocky Horror Stage Show. Two new UK tour dates have been announced. The show will be performed at the New Oxford Theater on Saturday, January 29th, 2022, and at the Regent Theater in Stroke-on-Trent on Saturday, June 4th, 2022. Stroke-on-Trent. Yo, who's Trent? Is he prettier than me? I don't know, but it sounds like he's into Bukaki. Aren't we all? What? Nothing. It's a bit of a bummer that these are a whole year away, but it's definitely for the best if we all stay safe for now. It's really nice to see that the tour dates are still being scheduled, even if it's not for a while. This is an awesome thing to look forward to, especially if you're in the UK and have a good chance of being able to actually go to the show. Don't worry, Nikki. We've got some fun bukkake, I mean stage show news, coming up in our community segment that's a little bit closer to home. Yeah, these are kind of uh, rescheduling, kind of not, of shows that were canceled. We'll see. If you want to check out the new stage show tour info, we've got a link for you in our show notes. So recently, there was a GalaxyCon Q&A with a lot of the Rocky Horror cast. The last GalaxyCon question and answer we covered was Nell, Barry, and Pat, who are all amazing to see and hear. But this time around, we were also treated to Meatloaf, who is apparently the Bible-studying, bad-at-computers boomer of the cast. We also saw the same interviewer, Patty Hawkins, moderating, reading audience questions, and interacting with everyone. 
And as we previously discussed, for those of you who are hardcore fans of the original cast, you could arrange for one-on-one -on -one video sessions with them and also purchase personalized autographs all through GalaxyCon. Oh yeah, speaking of which, did anybody remember to tell Jacob he could have bought a Zoom call with Barry Bostwick to ask about his butt? <sighs> Nikki, you know he'd just treat it like the most expensive phone sex line ever. Like he even has $145. <laughs> he sure as shit doesn't. But let's get back to the Q&A. First off, can you believe how familiar they all were? Like Nell, Pat, Barry, and Meatloaf. They were just sucking each other off like nobody's business right from the start. I know. When Barry called Pat beautiful as always, and Pat called him so kind, and he said, oh no, I'm not, it's the truth. Like, the man has an unnecessary amount of charm for someone with no one to use it on. I mean, he is married already, right? Wait, are you implying that spouses don't try to charm each other? No, no, I can support Nikki here. Me and Meg gave up, like, outside Oakley Court as soon as the ceremony wrapped. Take my wife, please, straight to the moon! Yeah, speaking of sad old things... Hey... Meatloaf has had six surgeries since September. Yeah, Oof. that's kind of a bummer, but apparently five were elective. So we only had one really serious surgery for a broken arm that was late last year. And now we have the meat, as it were, of the Q&A. Fuck off. <laughs> I'll see you later. These sessions are mostly driven by the audience questions, but the moderator had one locked and loaded from GalaxyCon. And their first question was, what's the best part about being a part of this film? Nikki. How did you feel about being mentioned in Barry's response? <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought it was really cool of Barry to mention all the shadow casters he's met as the highlight of his involvement in Rocky Horror. I also felt like he really gave a sense of how well he works with shadow casts and how much he likes them. He made a point of how he loves that shadow cast performances keep him in the present. They've opened him up to new experiences and have taught him to be accepting and brave. It was crazy to think that me, or someone like me, or a whole cast has taught Barry Bostwick anything about being brave. And then Meatloaf went even further, adding that they can never really repay the debt owed by them to the fans. As a fan, as an Eddie, that was really nice to hear. One of my favorite stories of all time to tell is actually going to a Meatloaf concert. It was back when I had first started joining in on Rocky, and my girlfriend at the time, my roommate, my dad and I all took a three-hour trip to go drive over to see Meatloaf performing at this casino that was nearby. It was awesome. My girlfriend wore my Eddie jacket, and we got right up close to the stage. We got to see all the songs. It was great. I mean, Meatloaf's kind of a piece of shit now, but... It's still fun to have that great memory. It's one of my favorite memories with my dad. And regardless of, you know, what you think about the guy, I just love that that story relating to Rocky. So also in this interview, Nell mentioned this phone call she had with Richard O'Brien and how he was surprised Rocky was only ranked 12th on the Guardians list of the best Frankenstein movies. Small correction here, though. Nell, you beautiful Aussie bimbo. It looks like you did a little swim with the numbers, because she referenced Rocky as being 12th on the list, but it's actually 15th. Actually. Wah. Honestly, though, I was shocked that there have been enough Frankenstein movies to even make a list out of. 15 seems like a lot. Hold up. I'm surprised Rocky is a Frankenstein movie? Does that mean Rocky is Frankenstein? No, Frankenstein was the doctor. There is no way that Dr. Scott is Frankenstein? Depending on which version of Rocky you're watching, whether it's the movie or the stage show, Frankenstein would either be Frank or Riff Raff. Moving on, apparently we almost had a Skeddy in the movie. Meatloaf said he really wanted to play Dr. Scott too, and even had a few conversations with Jim Sharman about it. Partly because that's how it was in the stage version, partly for some weird, froofy, artsy reason that he couldn't clearly articulate himself. I can only assume he means that the context of having both characters played by the same actor made a lot of sense to him, and he'd really enjoyed playing both roles during the stage show in L.A. Meatloaf has totally said this story before and has expressed that same kind of thing. Yeah, it's something about Eddie wanting to, like, find himself... Eddie as Dr. Scott, having a greater urgency than a Dr. Scott who wasn't Eddie himself looking for Eddie. 
I'm not really sure. My head hurts. It kind of sounded something like Charlie Kaufman would say about any of his movies. Yeah, but then Jim Sharman came back and told him that he had made a mistake not putting him in both roles. I kind of feel that. It would have been a very different vibe, although then we wouldn't have had Jonathan Adams, and I can't imagine not having him as Dr. Scott. That'd be really weird, man. Yeah, he played the narrator in the original stage show, and Charmin really wanted to include him in the film. So, back to the Q&A. The first audience question we got is about their favorite songs from the film. And I'm not really sure how it happened, but somehow Barry started serenading everyone with a lovely rendition of Once in a While, which, to point Barry, is not even in the film. I sort of remember that, but I also couldn't really focus because right around that time, Meatloaf was, like, glitching in and out, but only in his chin area. So it sort of looked like he was endlessly barfing on himself. Honestly, highlight of the interview. What? Ew. They went on to talk about their mentors. Barry and Meatloaf had some interesting name drops. Yeah, I did a quick Google search about Ellis Robb, the actor-director Barry talked about as having as a mentor. Some highlights of his included winning a Tony for directing The Royal Family in 1976 and also forming the Association of Producing Artists, which later merged with the Phoenix Theater to mount multiple Broadway revivals and to bring new works to Broadway. He also served as Kelsey Grammer's inspiration for the creation of Sideshow Bob on The Simpsons. And then Meatloaf mentioned Joseph Papp as his mentor, and this dude has a storied career, including founding Shakespeare in the Park, which was then called the New York Shakespeare Festival, and founding the Public Theater. Unfortunately, he did not serve as the inspiration for any wacky cartoon characters. Aww. No, so- <laughs> Nell sort of listed her mother or maybe daytime TV as her mentor. I'm not sure. But she came back to her story of being misdiagnosed and having her appendix removed. It made me wonder if this story was more of a turning point in her life than Nell lets on. Yo, being dramatically misdiagnosed is pretty terrifying. Experiences like that can definitely stick with you. It's really unfortunate to hear about it occurring with her, but I can see why it would have been like a core memory in her life. Oh, uh, one fun question our panelists got to cover was about how their families reacted to seeing them in the movie. I definitely sympathized with Beatloaf the most with that answer. He was straight up just like, I didn't have any family, and then listed off all the family members that he didn't have. No brothers, no sisters, no mother, and on and on and on. It was like kind of depressing, but he also got to see it with Jim Steinman and Ellen Foley, who orchestrated Bad Out of Hell and vocally collaborated on it with Meatloaf, respectively, which I thought was really awesome. Being able to see it with some of your closest friends that you're also working professionally with, just chef's kiss. Yeah, I definitely vibed with Pat Quinn. Quinn somehow worked in a story where she was yelling at her daughter for not bringing in her grandchild to see the show at a more recent showing, and matriarchal family conflict really resonates with me. Yeah, being the only sane one, I really like Nell's story about just having parents who saw it and were happy for her and were sort of unfazed by the whole thing. No? No? Okay. Actually, I changed my mind. Barry's story about his teenage kids having to be wrangled into seeing the show by their friends and then afterwards never talking to each other about the show was best for me. Strained family relationships are where it is at. I did think it was really funny that Meatloaf told the story where him and Tim Curry tried to see the show one time and they had to try and get in by telling the box office manager we're we're Tim Curry and Meatloaf and the manager not really believing them coming up to him later and being like you better be who you'd say you are we've heard this story from Tim a few times and it was really funny to hear it from Meatloaf we've forgotten someone what do you mean guys really the star of this Q&A what are you talking about Nikki were we watching the same panel guys Tallulah hello who Oh, yeah, Nell's cat. Um, no, not Nell's cat. Nell's cat, absolute star of the panel. From 33 minutes and 35 seconds to 33 minutes and 50 seconds, we have Kitty on screen. That's over 15 seconds of heart-wrenching Kitty screen time. Not gonna lie, Tallulah definitely won my vote at that point. Vote for what? We're voting? I'm still unclear on who Tallulah is. And you shall remain unclear as we slip right on into the next question the panel got about the most challenging moment when filming. I was really surprised we got to see an accidental Tropic Thunder reference there. 
Tropic what? Yeah, so Barry once had to deliver a line in sync with two fighter jets taken off behind him. The takeoff and the landing of which cost a total of $10,000. Can you imagine having to deliver a line on which $10,000 hinged? Imagine two jets running behind you for $10,000. That's nothing. I've had three New York jets running on me for much less than $10,000. What? 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 Funnily enough, Nell also had an interesting moment when filming a scene in The Killing Fields with a helicopter. Wait, Nell played opposite a helicopter? Very funny. So, another great thing about covering these con panels is it gives us an opportunity to end our summary segment by answering some of the questions that the cast got to answer. Like, how did your family react to seeing you in the movie? So, Aaron, Nikki... What were your family's reaction to seeing you on stage in the Rocky Horror Picture Show? You know, mine is going to be exactly as uninteresting as you would expect. My parents are super supportive. I come from a theater background. So when college-aged me told my parents, hey, I'm performing in the Rocky Horror. I'd love for you guys to come see it. Their response was, of course, oh my God, yes. Can we help? What can we do? Do you need to help making costumes? Should we look at stuff? Oh, how do you learn the blocking? Do you need to learn lines? How does that work? Can we come and see you? It was very supportive. It was wonderful. They've seen me several times and they always love it. Yeah, I, I got nothing here. My, my story is just happy and wonderful. <laughs> love you, mom and dad. <laughs> Uh, my parents do not like Rocky Horror, but when I debuted, the first time I ever performed, my godfather came to the show, uh, and he's like six seven and very awkward and does not, should never have seen Rocky Horror. So I, I just, I really enjoy the idea of my very large, very shy godfather sitting front row. Oh seeing all of my closest friends in lingerie it was it's an experience it's an experience i'm sorry nikki i was so confused when you said he was six seven i thought you were talking about a six or a seven year old no six foot seven someone who's yeah you know i got there but <laughs> it made the rest of your story really funny yeah he's six foot seven seven year old godfather i don't get it <laughs> my seven year old godfather uh my parents uh, have never seen me perform in Rocky, and they probably never will. My mom did make a Twitch account so she could watch the Halloween show. And when I asked her what she thought about it, she didn't really give me, like, a, I loved it or I hated it. She was just kind of like, good job. And I was like, you know what? That's probably the best that I'm going to get, and I'm happy with that. All right. Yeah. And with that, community news. Earlier, we talked about some new events being added to the Rocky Horror Show's calendar over in the UK, and it looks like we're going to be getting another stage show stateside in Philly. Oh, that's much more accessible than England. Right? The Forbidden Planet Players are a new independent theater company that produces the Rocky Horror Show annually for the greater Philadelphia area. So the company, who is run by a Taylor Keller, is currently gearing up to produce their first ever performance of the Rocky Horror Show. And their description for the performance reads, If you've never been to a live performance of Rocky Horror, you will be in for a treat. We will have gift bags, costume contests, dancing, and much, much more. In this cult classic, sweethearts Brad and Janet, stuck with a flat tire during a storm, discover the eerie mansion of Dr. Frankenfurter, a transvestite scientist. As their innocence is lost, Brad and Janet meet a houseful of wild characters. Through elaborate dances of rock songs, Frankenfurter unveils his latest creation, a muscular man named Rocky. Dun dun dun. We want to provide you a night out that you'll never forget. So help us host our own, hopefully annual, Transylvanian convention for Philadelphia's unconventional conventionalists. And let's, after a very, very long hiatus, do the time warp again. I realized that I had to be the one to read that because I'm from Philadelphia. Gritty Nation. Oh, God. Yo, I would actually love to see a version of Rocky Horror where Gritty is Rocky. Anybody else? Just me? Is Gritty that mascot? Yeah, the Flyers mascot, who is literally the incarnation of Philadelphia's rage and 
insanity, like all in one delicious, horrifying individual. Yeah, with peace and love, I'd rather eat glass. Yeah. The big orange fluffy mascot guy, right? Yeah, the yes. big orange fluffy mascot that reportedly has punched children. Yeah, him. Hot. Yeah, he's he's beautiful. So Taylor, if you're listening to this, why not make Rocky gritty? Why not? Make Rocky gritty again? Yeah. Don't be shy. Rocky sings in the stage show. You really want gritty singing? Yes. It doesn't matter who I you put in the express- costume. <laughs> I, I guess that's fair. I cannot express enough how much I want Gritty to sing in this show. <laughs> God, fucking put John in the Gritty costume. And Sign, just call I'm done. It a night. I'm moving to Philadelphia. Fuck I'm all of you. I'm playing Frank. John's playing Gritty Rocky. This is uh-huh. going to be great. <laughs> okay. Anyway, back to the show. We reached out to Taylor Keller, FPP's artistic director, to find out a little more. <laughs> PP. Yes, I said PP. <laughs> We reached out to Taylor Keller, FPP's artistic director, to find out a little more about the company and the show, and Taylor could not have been sweeter. She's currently a student pursuing a master's degree in arts administration and decided to create FPP just this past year, in October (laughs) of 2020. It's not my fault you're laughing. Uh, In October of 2020, when she realized she wasn't in love with a lot of the performances being produced in her area and decided to form her own theater troupe. Taylor admitted to us, a little sheepishly, that she found Rocky through glee and became interested in the movie simply because she wanted more context after watching the episode. Don't you dare gag. The Rocky Horror Glee Show episode is one of the best episodes of Glee. No. Yes. I mean, I believe that. Yep. But, come on, guys. To be fair, our audience numbers went way up for like six months after that episode aired, so she certainly wasn't alone with her thoughts. Valid. But anyway, after watching Glee and the movie, Taylor lost her Rocky virginity at a live shadow cast and has been hooked ever since. She mentioned to us that she spent some time studying abroad in London during undergrad and was even able to see the stage show at the Royal Court Theater where it was originally performed. Ooh. Yeah, right? While not super involved in the shadow casting community, Taylor performed as Columbia with Frankie's Midnight Runners cast based in Delaware when they put on the stage show back in 2018. Taylor told us that her goal for this upcoming production is to bring a little light back to the Philadelphia area, because we could all use a night out of fun once we're all vaccinated and it's safe to go out again. I'm just hopeful to return to theater, Taylor says. I really miss the feeling of collaboration with fellow artists, and I really love doing Rocky. There's just something about the show that fulfills my little performer's heart. That's such a sweet quote. Yeah, we are with you there, Taylor. (laughs) And at present, this production is tentatively scheduled to run sometime in October of this year. Although, that kind of depends on, you know, all the shit that's happening and whether or not Gritty is available to play Rocky. It may be postponed <laughs> until it can be put on safely and with Gritty. Right. <laughs> I'm not letting this go. No, you're not. I like it. I like you. Taylor did stress to us how important it is that everything is orchestrated safely, stating that I'm trying to think optimistically. With the rollout of vaccines, I'm hopeful that I can get this production on its feet for October, and I'm definitely making choices to make sure I'm not contributing to the spread of COVID by any means. Part of this includes making sure that everyone who steps foot onto the production, cast, crew, patrons, are vaccinated. It's important to me that everyone feels safe, and I'm still in the process of learning how theater can return safely. As are we all. This is, again, this is why we need to add Rocky as Gritty, because we can't like, how, how is the person playing Rocky going to be able to spread COVID to anybody? He's in a gigantic His costume. His face is a mask. Yeah. Stop. An entire Rocky show made out of mascots. I'm here that, for it. <laughs> that's that's just a puppet show. Go watch Avenue Q. Maybe I will. <laughs> All right. Well, the Forbidden Planet players currently have an ongoing fundraiser on GiveButter.com to help offset production costs, which, fair, putting on a theatrical production is expensive as fuck. They're offering backers some really great incentives with the low-end tiers, offering goodies like stickers, postcards, and social media and program shoutouts, and the high-end tiers offering even more baller swag like t-shirts, gift bags, and even tickets to opening night. The company is also seeking sponsors. This performance is being produced independently, and of course... Finding funding for indie theater projects is always an issue. So if you or someone you know might be interested in sponsoring an independent version of the Rocky Horror Show, the Forbidden Planet players would absolutely love to hear from you. 
Taylor also mentioned to us that she's currently in the middle of her homework phase for this production, meaning that she's figuring out budget, looking for potential people to work with on this show, basically doing all of the prep work that needs to happen in the early stages of putting on a performance. She let us know that at present, she's feeling a little overwhelmed because she's figuring it all out by herself and could totally use any help or insight that our community members are able to offer. So if your cast has put on an indie version of the stage show and you think you might be able to offer Taylor a helping hand, if you're interested in being a production sponsor or you just want to learn more about the company, you can contact the Forbidden Planet Players on Facebook and Instagram, or you can email them at ForbiddenPlanetPlayers at gmail.com. All of that is linked in our show notes, too. We are certainly all hoping this production is able to be performed and attended safely in October. If we are all vaccinated and able to start living our lives again, I will absolutely take a trip down to Philly to check out this show. Hell yeah, I feel like a small indie performance would be an absolute blast. Road trip, road trip. Nikki, if it's safe, I'll make Josh drive us all there myself. Hot. Yay! If you'd like to learn more about the Forbidden Planet players, their upcoming Rocky Horror Show production, or their fundraiser, you can check out their website at ForbiddenPlanetPlayers.com, and all of that information is also in our show notes. Speaking of Rocky shows, Colorado's Elusive Ingredient show aired last night. Did you guys get a chance to watch it? We certainly tried. They had some pretty major technical difficulties throughout the show. It looked like the host stream they were using was having some issues with frame drop. That always really sucks. Technical issues are really shitty, especially with live performances. Everyone works so hard on show prep, and all you can do is keep going. Hope the issues resolve themselves. Honestly, their entire cast was so smoking hot in their costumes, I didn't even notice any tech issues. And there were some really funny show moments we were able to catch. Eddie being yeeted away with a broom by Columbia had me absolutely rolling. Yeah, there Eddie was double cast as Riff, and a lot of his costumes were funny as hell. I thought it was hilarious that he performed in his riff jacket with his Eddie t-shirt underneath and just swapped jackets to transition between roles. Plus, did you catch that his spacesuit was totally made of, it looked like, construction paper? No? Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, I did. It was funny. (laughs) And meanwhile, Magenta was rocking a fur stole during takeover scene. Like, obviously not a takeover suit, but that's big Magenta energy if I've ever seen it. Everyone did seem like they were having a lot of fun, and from what we were able to see, their costumes and performances all looked great. A for effort. We love that you tried to give the community a great show, and maybe we'll be able to catch an encore performance sometime in the future. We'll certainly keep our fingers crossed. So, in the same vein, we got totally called out this week. Our friend Rowan wrote in this stupidly accurate meme. Nobody. Rocky talkie hosts, I literally shit my pants, came, and then pissed myself during this recent Zoom show. It was the best experience of my life. Not only am I a brand new person, but I quit performing. Literally nothing will live up to this Zoom show. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, I mean, Rowan, you've got us there. Listen... I'm bored as hell, sitting in my room by myself all the freaking time. I haven't been able to go out and have fun with my friends in a whole year, and this community has been a huge part of what's been keeping me through all this shit. You think I'm gonna have anything but awesome stuff to say about people putting on a show and entertaining me during lockdown? Hell no. Yeah, I I know we suck the performers' dicks a lot, but we just all miss performing live and hanging out. Having virtual shows all the time has really helped keep us all in some kind of normalcy and maintain our connection to the community. I feel like the best part of talking about them here is being able to recap all of our favorite highlights and just get that after-the-show feel where we all get a rave about the things we loved. Yeah, Rowan, we're going for blanket positivity here. Fucking fight us about it. Meet me outside of the Wendy's, bitch. Sir, this is a Wendy's. And speaking of positivity, I was so excited to talk about this community project when I found out about it. Artists who work on Rocky pieces are so near and dear to my heart that I couldn't wait to share this on this show. An Instagram artist named El Davio is working on a project that they describe as a contemporary take on art in a piece that celebrates the Rocky horror community. 
So we spoke to El Davio a little bit about this project, and we learned back in November that El Davio created a picture of Frankenfurter and posted it to Instagram. They got a lot of offers to buy on the piece and took inspiration from Stanley Chow, who is an illustrator from Manchester, UK, who has been selling prints of the mayor and giving proceeds to the mayor's charity. So El Davio sold the Frankenfurter piece and donated the proceeds to the Trussell Trust Food Bank. And they've now decided to continue this trend of creating art for charity and have created their Instagram account at Frankenfooder to host the project. El Davio's current project will feature a collection of sketches of Rocky Horror Shadowcasters in costume, and they're currently seeking in-costume photo submissions from members of the community to be included in the piece. They've already made a ton of progress and have included lots of pictures on our friends within the community. It's really cool to see. I submitted a photo. Yo, this is cool as hell. And we should all submit photos for this project. I love the charity aspect of it almost as much as I love the idea of having an artist draw me like one of their French girls. My hot ass deserves to be memorialized. If you're interested in checking out this project and maybe submitting an in-costume photo, check out at Frankenfooder on Instagram. You can send any submissions to that account too. We'll have a link to that account in our show notes. Moving on to another exciting community update. If you backed Fred Moreau's Repo Enamel Pin Series, the Kickstarter has closed and Fred is currently working on the end stages of getting the pins produced. His most recent update to the Kickstarter page says he's working on getting a final count on the quantities of the different pins that he needs to ship. I know Meg and I just got our survey this week and we got to choose how many of each one we wanted. He's also finalizing all the bonus and freebie merch that will be shipped alongside the pins. So if you were an early bird backer or purchased one of the tiers that came with extra swag, you have that to look forward to. And in the meantime, if you're a project backer and you want to add any items from the RKO Army Etsy shop, there is a link on the Kickstarter page to use that will allow you to bundle your Etsy purchase with your repo pins so everything gets shipped together for free. We've got links to both pages in our show notes, so why not make some virtual impulse purchases? I know I sure have. I bought the TikTok leggings. Did you? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Seriously, though, the dopamine hit from getting mail these days is real. I know I'll order stuff online and completely forget about it just to be surprised when it gets to my door. Rocky stuff is especially good for that, and I do like knowing that my impulse purchases are supporting our friends over at RKO and everywhere else. Yeah, definitely go check out their page. They make great gifts for your loved ones or for yourself, and it's never too early to start shopping for... St. Patrick's Day? Speaking of Rocky merch, a new Facebook group has popped up that I just found, and I'm absolutely obsessed with it. It's called Rocky Horror Picture Show in the Wild. The group's description is, you know we all see them. We see the lips, we see Columbia's shorts, we see the maid's outfit, and sometimes even the props. If you see anything Rocky Horror related out in the wild, take a picture of it and post it here to share with the group. I feel like I've been waiting my whole life for this group because, of course, we all see stuff that looks like Rocky stuff constantly. And what do you do? You take a stupid picture, you send it to a couple of your friends, but it's such a small group of people who are actually in on the joke. This group lets the in-joke be a little bit bigger, and it really delivers on content. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff on this page, and it's all really funny. A lot of pictures of lips, of course, but also, what was a good one? Um, Oh, the massage chair. Someone posted a picture of a massage chair recently that looked like it was made out of spacesuit fabric. It had the golden black color scheme. It was even kind of the right sort of quilted. It was really funny. There's also a lot of, like, street clothing versions of Rocky costumes where the pattern or color scheme will match this costume piece. Funny things like that. It's all very shitposty in like a really fun way. I'm hoping that the group continues to grow because we are all super entertained by this sort of content and I know we would all love to see more of it. If you've got some instances of Rocky Horror in the Wild that you'd like to share, we're linking to the group in our show notes. We are all members and we can't wait to see your posts. When I was in high school, I was, I had just joined FNS and I was doing the graphic design for FNS and I also took like a few classes that were basically study halls just because I was a senior and like I didn't need these classes anymore. So for most of the period, I would just like go down to the tech room and I would do ads for FNS and I had an administrator login so I could download things to the cloud. 
but I didn't know that everything I was downloading wasn't just being uploaded to like my computer, it was going to the network. So every single computer had like double feature font on it and pictures of the lips and stuff. And I didn't know that. So then uh, around the end of my senior year, when kids started committing to colleges, there was an assignment in a digital arts class or something where you made a shirt for your college that you committed to. So the next day, like all these girls made their shirts and they came in and hella bitches came in with like Rocky lips and double feature font saying like Sacred Heart University and shit. (laughs) And I was like, oh no. And I follow them on Instagram to this day and they'll still wear these shirts. And I look at it and I'm like, I did this. I made this mistake and I feel horrible about it. Like, (laughs) wow. And that's it. That's my biggest regret. I don't blame you. (laughs) <laughs> that is fucking great. I mean, John, as, as somebody in education, I bet that burns you to your soul just being like, you used unlicensed fonts on shirts for school functions? Yup. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Piss off. Oh, man. That's funny. Speaking of funny. Let's move on to Nikki asks a question. Today continues to be the Rowan Show, as they've also sent us a fantastic write-in this week that I'm pretty pumped about, and I think this one could be a real stumper. To be fair, Rowan sent this one in a few weeks ago, and we have been saving it up. Which really means that it took me way too long to research it. Yeah, that too. But I, I think you'll be really happy with the info we've dug up. So Rowan writes, Okay. This has been a question I've been seeking an answer to for a long time. I am super interested in the subject of makeup. I know most modern Broadway shows and musical film adaptations use MAC Cosmetics as a supplier. Some of these shows include Wicked, The Rocky Horror Show, Kinky Boots, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, Angels in America, Moulin Rouge, and many more. Seeing as Mac came out in the mid-80s, I was wondering if there were certain brands or suppliers used for the film or stage show. Of all my questions, I think this is the one I am most interested in getting an answer to. Hope to hear back. Thank you so much for writing in, Rowan. That's actually a very interesting and exciting question for me personally. Uh, I really love Broadway and costume design aspects of it. And it never even dawned on me that like specific brands would be used for shows. Like in my head, I was like, oh, they just roll up to the local CVS and you get what you get. But that's actually really cool. I'd really like to get into this. That is an extremely specific question, Rowan. Now, where in the hell would anyone possibly fucking find out what brands of makeup were used while making a movie almost 50 fucking years ago? Uh, John? (sighs) Fucking course, you know. Hey, we'll get to the movie, but Rowan asked about the stage show first. Let's talk about that. Sue Blaine did all the costumes for the stage show. I'm sure she had a hand in the makeup. She did certainly have some input, but for the show, all the actors were really responsible for their own makeup. Both the director Jim Sharman and Richard O'Brien had a vision for the characters, But the actors really were the ones in control of their look. After all, they were putting it on themselves. As you do. So Tim Curry said in an interview that his original stage show Frank makeup was like really raw. So he said, in the play, I used to slosh that makeup on with a trowel. I was really brutal with it. In the film, I ended up looking like a rather crazed version of Bianca Jagger. And later on, he said that one of the best parts about the show was that most of the makeup had gone in about 20 minutes. Usually it had all sweated off his face almost immediately, and he had made that part of his look. He described it as grungy and punky. Yeah, the most complete story of the original makeup process comes from the original stage show Rocky, that's Rainer Burton, in his autobiographical account, The Rocky Horror Show, As I Remember It. In part of the often self-deprecating book, he talks about working to become the man that Frank has been making. That's with blonde hair and a tan. Don't ever ask me to try and do my Frank impression. I won't. He quipped that the blonde hair was never a problem, but his tan needed work. Sue Blaine even broached the issue with him on one occasion, where they both acknowledged that he could use body paint to give himself a more muscled look. I feel seen. But neither really liked the idea as it would make the costuming a mess with Rocky's wraps and whatnot. And it would require someone to apply the makeup every night, but they didn't have the budget for that. 
They didn't have the budget for much of anything. No makeup artists, no hairdressers, no understudies. There's actually quite a story behind Burton's hunt for the perfect tan. He had ruled out sunbeds as being too expensive. And sun lamps, he said, left you looking like a color inverted panda bear. And the fake tans on the market looked too orange and streaky. Just ask the former president about that one. Ah! Burton recalled one successful experiment with a spa-like treatment from a salon at the famous Whiteleys of Queensway department store. This leads to a really awkward story about how out of place he was going to the salon, him being naked and having this woman lathering up his entire body. You get way too much detail there. So while the treatment worked to give him a really convincing tan, unfortunately, it turned out to only last a few days and they didn't have the funds to keep going back over and over. That's how all happy ending spas work. They've got to keep you coming back. <laughs> coming. He eventually settled on an aerosol self-tan foam that applied without leaving streaks and it dried quickly. With daily applications during the run of the show, it built up a deep tan that made him glisten and gleam, just as Frank described. Of course, he needed assistance to apply the fake tan to the part of his back that he was unable to reach. He said it was usually Tim Curry or Richard O'Brien who obliged him the favor. But on a few rare occasions, Nell would do him the honor. Nell can do me the honor anytime. <laughs> do. As for the oiled up look, that too went through some iteration. He tried olive oil, but lamented that it left him smelling like he had taken a bath in salad dressing. And he ended up settling on baby oil, which didn't help with the tan, but did glisten and gleam. Frank did say he would make him glisten and gleam. And Burton really wanted to gleam. He recalls that as the sets were being built during rehearsals, he noticed that there always seemed to be a bag of glitter around that they used on the sets. He said that the glitter's draw was like irresistible and used it to highlight various parts of his body where muscles should be bulging. Realizing the baby oil would act as an adhesive for the glitter, he applied it under his pecs, highlighted his six pack, extenuated his biceps and thigh muscles, and applied a little to his eyebrows for camp. He remembered that the effect was stunning and used that glitter for the whole of the run at the theater upstairs all the way up until the very last show. Because little did he know, the glitter's main ingredient was not powder, but crushed glass. Oh god, please don't tell me this is going where I think it is. It is. The introduction that Rainer himself writes sums up this story pretty well. He says... It is a very well-known fact, now fabled, that the final performance at the theater upstairs had to be canceled because glitter found its way into a delicate part of my anatomy. Though the glitter he was using was powder-like, it was actually made from extremely sharp crushed glass. Effectively, Homeboy was rubbing broken glass all over himself. Uh. Yeah, through a very, very upsetting chapter, Burton retells a story of misadventure involving the quick floor show change, baby oil, satin briefs, and glitter, combining into a, quote, volatile cocktail, every pun intended. Oh my god, this is horrifying. Yes, in excruciating detail, we find out how the glass shards of glitter grinds into his penis for the remainder of the show after his floor show change, the train ride home, and all throughout the night, leading to a horrifying, infected, bleeding mess of cuts oozing pus. Fuck, no. Nope, 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 nope. Fuck, nope. Not doing this. Not doing this. No. Well, of course, the show must go on. So, after a day of nursing his penis, which is a sentence that no one has ever said before until right now, Burton got a cab to the theater upstairs for the final performance, barely able to walk or move the entire way there. The cast and crew knew something was wrong immediately, and quickly ushered him into the dressing room where he sat in the shower with water pouring over his dick. And as each person in the cast arrived, they inspected his damaged member and quickly realized the show was in jeopardy, considering how they could restage the show. Remember, no understudies. 
Jim Sharman, after taking one look at the horrifying sight of Burton's penis, lashed out, wishing that he had told the theater sooner, saying, Nell could have played Rocky. A throwback that the show was originally written without the character of Columbia at all. Oh my god, the world missed out that day on little Nell playing Rocky, which would have been fucking amazing. I want to live in that world. The show was canceled obviously, and the audience had to be turned away, including rock and roll icon Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. So when Jagger was asked why the show was canceled, he was told by the manager, Rocky's got something the matter with his cock, to which Mick Jagger casually replied, haven't we all? Oh, for fuck's sake. Management quickly summoned a doctor who, upon arriving at the theater, exclaimed as he saw Burton's penis, my God. God, what on earth's happened to your cock? A quick injection of a morphine-like barbiturate helped to ease the pain, but the doctor was forced to lance Burton's penis as it had swelled to twice its normal size to drain the infection. What? Lancing? Like with the scalpel? Jesus Christ, this story keeps getting worse and worse. Ugh. Yeah. All right, well, fortunately, the doctor took great care of Burton. He was laid up for much of the two-week break that the show took as it transferred from theater upstairs to the Chelsea Classic, but still managed to produce the cast recording and prep for the show, which had one really big addition. They finally hired two understudies! You heard it here first, folks. Don't rub glass on your dick, boys. Fun fact, Rainer Burton is circumcised. (laughs) But was he before the start of the story? (laughs) Oh, fuck yourself. If I never have to hear about his dick again, I can die a happy woman. So what about the movie? Most of the stuff that I've seen credits the makeup design to Pierre LaRoche, but I can never really find a lot about it. Yeah, that's not really all that surprising. There's a bit of a mystery lost to time with the role that Pierre LaRoche played, though we have several interviews that kind of paint an incomplete but interesting picture. So, Pierre LaRoche was an incredibly famous theater and rock music makeup artist. He was most renowned for working with David Bowie, and was responsible for the iconic red and blue lightning bolt look on the cover of Aladdin Sane, which many have called, like, the Mona Lisa of album covers. In an interview with Kimmy Wong for Concept Occult, she recalled that Pierre was brought into the movie to synthesize all the ideas that had come about from the stage show. That makes sense. With the actors having done their own makeup for the show and Jim Sharman and Richard O'Brien having different ideas for the look of the movie, they brought him to form a cohesive look. Though how much he actually did is pretty unclear. We know for sure that he never worked on the actual film shoot. That distinction goes to Peter Rob King, who was billed simply as a makeup artist, but he took on the role of managing all of the logistics of the makeup department for the entire film shoot. He worked with a team of assistant makeup artists, Graham Freeborn, Ernest Gasser, and Jane Royal. And alongside were hairdressers Ramon Gao and assistant stylists Helen Lennox and Mike Lockie, who created all of the film's iconic looks. Peter believed that LaRoche may have provided some drawings or photographs, and that he definitely had some input, but that he didn't actually work on the production in any capacity. He concedes that he may have had some product availability, as they used a different range of pencils than were available. Ooh, interesting. Some of that specialized stuff he used with David Bowie, perhaps. In Jim Whitaker's Cosmic Light, Peter is reported to have only met with LaRoche once to receive notes, and that he had been responsible for hiring the team of artists who took on all of the makeup duties for the cast. This left Peter to handle just Patricia Quinn and Tim Curry's makeup. Tim Curry, he recalls, had a grueling two-hour application process, but he never complained during any of the 52 steps that were needed to create Frank's look. And Rowan, here's your answer, buddy. Peter Rob King recalls that Tim's look required a broader range of colors than the Max Factor film makeup used on the rest of the actors. He had to use an over-the-counter makeup line called Galitzine for Frank. So the majority of the film makeup was Max Factor, with some specialized brands for Frank and possibly some pencils from a different unknown range. I can see what you mean that most of the looks were polished versions of the stage show. There are a number of test photos from makeup designs that were ultimately rejected. At one point, they tried Frank with more angular eyebrows, purple eyeshadow, and purple lipstick. 
Black Lips were also tried for Riff as well, though similarly rejected, which I think was a good choice. That polished look was lamented by Tim Curry, saying that while he preferred the troweled on look from the play, the character Frankenfurter loved his new high fashion makeover. Tim said, quote, Frank loved it. He thought he was finally a movie star. Aw, I love that. It's so sweet. The poor track-marked morphine junkie transvestite from small town Transylvania makes it big in Hollywood. A couple of extra fun facts while we're on the topic of makeup. They tried all kinds of things to black out Patricia Quinn's face for the lips that sang science fiction double feature. They even resorted to various inks to try and color it, but it was impossible to hide all the pores for the camera. They considered printer's ink, but acknowledged that if you use anything on the skin that doesn't come off, you won't be re-employed. They ended up having to use polarizing lenses for the camera to black out the skin tone, but on the day that they filmed the lips, Pat showed up with a cold sore. They disguised it really well, but they said it was probably the absolute worst day possible that they could have chosen to do that scene. Oh my god, awkward. And did you know that the often touted mistakes of Frank's makeup and tattoos running and coming off during the pool scene was completely intentional? Like, they even had to use oils to break down the makeup to get it to run. For the first few takes, he came out of the pool looking too pristine. Oh, no way. So the real fuck up there is just in editing where they use the takes where he looked too pretty? Yup. And Peter Blake, who played Frank in the 1975 run at the King's Road, added a 666 tattoo in addition to Frank's other's tattoos. Also, in interviews, he would reimagine the 4711 tattoo as being a time travel souvenir from visiting World War II concentration camps. Ghastly. That's so dark. His version of Frank was supposed to be really different, so I guess he wanted to change everything up, including changing the tattoo source from the cologne reference that's intended. Yeah, his telling of this story in interviews is actually probably the original source of the urban legend falsity that floats around the internet that links the 4711 tattoo to the Holocaust. On the subject of Frank's tattoos, his boss tattoo was originally a skull with a vertical dagger. And after the run at the classic, Nell added glued silver sequins in place of eyeshadow. There's some crazy pictures of that. And lastly, in a story that I think we can all feel, uh, Patty O'Hagan, the original Eddie Dr. Scott, used KY jelly for his Eddie quaff. He said during an interview that the usual hair creams went flat and soggy and just ran all over the place. He would go through three or four tubes every single week, and as many of us can relate, he eventually explained to the pharmacist that he was part of the Rocky Horror cast, that's why he was buying so many tubes, which only seemed to make matters worse. <laughs> that's fucking gross, I love it. <laughs> Although he, he, he did say that like the stuff washed out like real easy, so it was great for keeping his hair in place. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that absolutely would. I mean, it's it's KY Jelly. That, that shit comes off with water. Not that I would know, but... I would know. Huh? No. Um, Nikki, what about you? Do you know anything about KY Jelly? I feel like KY Jelly is old people lube. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not afraid to say it. You're not wrong. <laughs> And on that note, that's our show. We want to thank our friend Rowan for writing in. We love you to bits, and we really appreciate how much support you've always shown our show. Thanks so much, Rowan. That was a great question. I love digging into it. We know you've sent us another question. We've got that one in the pipeline. Don't worry, we will be getting to it soon. If you're enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us spread the word about it. All you got to do is rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. It helps us make our podcast more visible to new listeners, which helps us to grow the show. Also, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. So please go check us out if you like us and want more content. And please write to us. We love hearing from all of our listeners. Getting messages from you makes our entire week. We especially want to hear about all the cool Rocky stuff you're working on and all the upcoming special events your casts are getting ready to do. 
We want to share it on our show and help you spread the word. If you're working on a Rocky-related project that you're excited about, if your cast is doing a show and you want to spread the word, or if you've got an amazing story from your Rocky Horror career, go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out our contact form to share with us. We'll talk to you all next week. No, we won't. Yes, we will, John. Yes, we will. We will. Yes. Yeah, we'll talk to all of you next week. We'll talk to you all next week. We'll talk to you all next week. Okay, bye. Bye. We'll talk to you all next week. Bye. Round. Round? Mm-hmm. Like the that one video of the end of the world? Damn, that is a pretty sweet earth, you might say. Round? No, just me? All right. Just you. All right. Two new UK door tapes. Oh my God. <laughs> good <laughs> Jesus, old, good old door tapes. Door tapes. <laughs> Conventionalist door tapes. Okay. Fuck off. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> this is me walking away. These got to use coconuts. <laughs> I'm too poor for that. How did you feel about being mentioned in Barry's response? Was I mentioned in his response? Oh, yes, by name. You should go listen to it. Mm-hmm. Was I really? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. But we, we'll let you believe it as long as you want. Okay. I was like, wait, I don't think I told him my name. <laughs> Why? Can you, can you tell Jacob wrote this? Why? Yeah. Be- <laughs> can you imagine having to deliver a line on which $10,000 hinged? I would what have the- absolutely <laughs> collapsed. Imagine two jets running behind you for $10,000. I don't want to say this. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? Do you want me to say it? No. I'll fucking... Uh, I... Mm. We can have John say it. That's okay. Yeah, John can say it too. No, I can say it. Jacob wrote this. This... Joke particularly was a group effort. We were all very high when we were writing this part of the script. Fucking hate you guys. Why? Why do you guys get stoned and write the script and not invite me? I should have a say. <laughs> anyway, that's nothing. I've had three New York Jets running on me for much less than ten thousand dollars. Let's move on to our next segment. Uh, community news. <clears throat> What I think about community news. Classy. Yeah. What does FPP stand for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I well, think you know for what it stands hot ladies, for. mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Meet me outside of the Wendy's, bitch. Sorry, Cobweb is... <laughs> I don't even know what she's doing. She's just... <laughs> She's like dragging her nose along the floor. <laughs> I've been looking at her for the past like 30 seconds. Like I'm trying to even think, like, what are you even doing? She's sniffing. Maybe she's itchy. You don't know. Mind your business. She's not even, she's literally like, like, <laughs> imagine just smacking your face on the floor and then using your legs to propel you forward. That's what she's doing. And I don't know why. Hey, we've all been drunk at one point or another, John. (laughs) Anyway, so. Crickets. Cricket. Fuck you. Let's move on to Nikki asks a question. That's not funny. (laughs) It's been Nikki all along. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. I'm watching too much WandaVision. Isn't everybody? It yeah, probably. Was great. Uh, usually he had it all. Usually he had. Mm, fuck me. Hold on, some. Hold on one second. Mm-hmm. Adam's in. Adam's in. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, I can right. tell he's in. I fucking <laughs> hate it here. Cobweb, that's a lot of water you're drinking over there, buddy. I don't want to clean that up later. Let her be thirsty, bro. She, oh. Oh, she do be thirsty. <laughs> don't, 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 don't be creepy. Oh. Don't know what to do. I'm shopping.
Hi, shopping. I'm John. Hi, John. Ghastly. That's so dark. No, that's a Pokemon. <laughs> what? Get you Ghastly. Said, Ghastly's yeah. a Pokemon. Yeah, Ghastly is the name of a Pokemon. Keep going. <laughs> I'm so good. Okay, whatever. Let me have my moment. <laughs> Ghastly. Fuck you Haunter. guys. Haunter. Ugh. Gas. I want to quit. I mean, the will be on. No. <sighs> Oh, on I'm the subject. On. Oh. Oh. Sorry, I yawned. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our show. Sorry. I'm not. <laughs> Should I end it like that? Yeah. All right. I'm going to sneeze. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. It's. Ah. Uh... Ah. Uh... <coughs> <coughs> Fuck Shut off, up. Meg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, whatever. Someone say bless you. Bless you. Thank you. All right. Talk to y'all next week. Bye. Next week. Next week. It's happening. Yep. I'm going to sneeze again. Next week. <coughs> next week. <coughs> yeah, bye. <laughs> <laughs> say bless you again. Bless you. And go fuck it. yourself. Beep, beep, beep.